for his work in Andrew's life. I'm thankful for the opportunity that Andrew will now have to minister to his family back in Australia. But make no mistake about it, we're going to miss him very much. Andrew is one of those people that whenever you see him, he is joyful. Even when he's not joyful, he's joyful. I don't know how that works, but it's true. Even when he's going through a rough time, you see the joy of the Lord in his life. He loves God. He loves the lost. And uh, he's a choice servant. And tonight after the evening service, we'll have an opportunity to uh, tell him uh, goodbye. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to look with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. We continue our study through Luke's account of the life and ministry and saving work of our Savior. We come this morning to what is commonly referred to as the triumphal entry. Verses 28 through 44 we will look at together. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went. Those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Lord, your word is now set before us. We need, we ask for your gracious, empowering, and assistance as we strive to declare it. Be our teacher this morning, Lord. Enlighten our thinking. Open our hearts. Grant us the strength that we need in our inner man to be able to receive the things given by you, by the work of your Spirit, through Luke. I pray for those in this room who do not know you, who do not have eternal life. Today, Lord, is a great opportunity for them. And my prayer is that they would not refuse it. But today would be the day of salvation for them, that, that today they would see and understand and believe and receive your Son. 
I pray for those of us, Lord, whom you have saved in this room. I pray for my brothers and sisters and myself, and I just ask that today would be a day of washing. Your word is pure water, and Lord, let it wash over us in such a way today that our sins would be put away, our hearts would be refreshed, our desire would be renewed, our zeal would be strong. We would realize that we exist for you and would live for you with all of our hearts from sincere hearts that do really desire and long for your glory. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a sad thing when men waste an opportunity given to them by God. When God extends His hand, as it were, in saving grace, when God extends to men a gracious opportunity to be forgiven, to be delivered, to be rescued, to be saved, and men refuse it. It's a sad thing. I want to warn us today that there is a view of God's sovereignty that will rob you of that reality. There is a view of God's sovereignty in the minds of some, in the hearts of some, that would basically reduce all of life to a cold determinism that would make all of man's choices not really real. And as a result, when you think about men refusing opportunities from God, well, first of all, in their minds, there are no real opportunities to be wasted. All of life is the same. Every day is the same. Every decision is the same. Because their view of God's sovereignty doesn't give real weight to man's responsibility. They, they lay such weight on the sovereignty of God that they, they ignore the reality of man's responsibility and his real choices that he's making every day. How many of you this morning know that men are making real choices today for which they are fully responsible? Fully responsible. Now do not misunderstand me. Does the Bible teach that God is sovereign in everything? He rules over everything. There's nothing left to chance. There is no such thing as chance. God is sovereign. And everything in this world is ultimately and finally going to accomplish everything that God ever intended. Every one of God's decrees will be perfectly fulfilled. He is sovereign over everything. There's not one stray atom in the universe. And salvation is all of God. Our salvation is completely explained by God. God granted everything to us that has meant our salvation, including our repentance and our faith. He didn't believe for us. He didn't repent for us. But he granted to us what we needed in order to believe and to repent. So those are gifts from God also. So God is sovereign in salvation. He shows mercy to whomever he chooses to show mercy. He hardens whomever he will. That's the living God who is described for us on the pages of Scripture. But men are really making choices today. If you ask, does man have a free will? The answer is yes, depending upon how you understand free will. <clears throat> man is free to make choices every day. He's choosing every day according to what he really most desires. This is true. But he's making those choices within this prison that sin has created in his nature. He's free only to the extent of his moral nature and his spiritual condition. So he is dead in trespasses and sin. He is blinded as a result of sin. He lives with a darkened understanding. He is alienated from the life that is found in God. And he makes all the choices he wants to make within that dark box called his fallen nature. He chooses what he wants. He just doesn't want God. He chooses what he wants. He just doesn't want truth. And so it takes a, a sovereign, merciful, gracious work of God to open a man's eyes, to open his heart, to grant him life, to set him free, to release him from that prison. 
So that it is true to say at the same time that God is sovereign in salvation, yet men are making choices every day that are really their choices and they are completely responsible for those choices. And the result of that is when men have life and death set before them and they are left to themselves, they choose death. And that's sad. And if these things are not real, then I say to you, that the tears of Jesus, the weeping of Jesus, would have just been a sham. It would have meant nothing. Here's what I want to caution us about. When you have a sovereign Savior who can weep over the choices of men, then something is wrong with our view of that Savior if we can't weep over the choices of men. If the sovereign Savior weeps over the sinful choices of men, then our understanding of Him and of God's sovereignty must allow us to weep over the sinful choices of men. That's what we're going to see today in our verses. We've come to the end, to the end of the journey. Jesus set His face to go to Jerusalem. He has now arrived. Four days after this day, He's going to be crucified. And on this day, He makes a an entrance into the city of Jerusalem that reveals two great truths. It reveals him and it reveals us. It reveals his royal nature. It reveals man's ruined condition. It reveals his true character. It reveals sinful man's true character. And what we learn here is powerful, it's sobering. Today, in this place, an opportunity is set before men. Today, in this room, Jesus will be set before us on the pages of God's Word in the verses that we've just read. And the question is, today, this opportunity that you have today, God extending His hand in grace, God extending His hand in a call to salvation, God extending to you the opportunity of deliverance, forgiveness, Salvation, what will you do with this opportunity today? Would Jesus weep over you? Would we find ourselves weeping over you because you waste a day of opportunity? We're going to look at these verses this morning under three headings. Preparation, celebration, lamentation. Christ is put on display. Our need for Christ is put on display through preparation, celebration, Lamentation. Notice first of all preparation, verses 28 through 34. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Let's stop there. First of all, we're introduced again to the, to the previous context in those words where it says in verse 28, and when he had said these things. What things? The parable that we just studied about the, 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 um, the king who goes away entrusts minas to his servants, a, a man of noble birth, he's going to return a king. And he says, until I return, you take these things, you invest them. We learned about this last Sunday and how he's going to hold them responsible. And he returns, in fact, and they have to give an account to him. That parable indicated, as Jesus has already been telling his disciples, that the kingdom, is not going, the kingdom in its earthly sense is not going to appear immediately. Jesus is the king. There's going to be a kingdom. But first, he has come to lay down his life to save us. He has come to give his life to save his people from their sins. So there's going to be a rejection of him. There's going to be his crucifixion. There's going to be his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. He's going to go away to receive a kingdom. Then he's going to return. That's, this is what the parable was intended to teach. So when he had said these things, now they're going to experience what he has just taught them about. The Bible says he went on ahead. He went on ahead. Jesus is at the head of the procession as they make their way to Jerusalem on this day. It's a good reminder that though he knows exactly what is going to happen to him in the next week, he goes willingly. He goes with desire. He goes with determination. He goes courageously. He's at the head of this. He went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, where Jesus is at geographically, 
it has meant this ascent to the city of Jerusalem from the region of the Dead Sea. He, he came from Jericho, 17, 18 miles away from Jerusalem. Then he arrives in Bethany and now on the, on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. They will make their way up over the Mount of Olives down to the city of Jerusalem. This is the previous context, what he's just taught about his kingdom. Notice the immediate context, verse 29, when he drew near to Bethphage, in Greek it's Bethphage, some have pronounced it in English Bethphage. Uh, we, don't, we don't know where this little village was located, it doesn't exist today, so if we mispronounce its name no one will sue us or be upset with us. Bethphage and Bethany. Bethany, two miles to the east of Jerusalem, as I said, existing on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. We're not sure where Bethphage was, but right there in that same vicinity. Jesus has already been in Bethany for a couple of days because John 12 tells us that he arrived there six days before the Passover, the Passover on Friday when Jesus will be crucified. He arrived there six days before the Passover and there was uh, a dinner in his honor with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So he's already been in Bethany for a day or two. John 12 verse 1 says, Jesus therefore six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there and Martha was serving but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to, the, to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Let me just stop there. Isn't it insane the way these people thought? Lazarus died four days dead when Jesus raises him from the dead. So they just, here's their plan. We're going to kill him. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Just let that sink in. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So John 12 tells us Jesus has already been in Bethany. He's famous in Bethany. People are aware that he's there. People were enamored with Lazarus and what Jesus had done for Lazarus. People were coming out of the city of Jerusalem, would have come out on the day that we're reading about here, on the day of his triumphal entry. And so Jesus sets out on a Sunday, or some believe on a Monday, to make his way into the city of Jerusalem. By the way, Bethany means house of dates, just information for you to have. Bethphage means house of unripe figs. The Mount of Olives means of olive trees, so to a mountain called of olive trees. An agrarian society, the, the names reflecting that. Now we see in verse, having, having the context established, now we see what is an amazing confirmation of Jesus as Messiah. One of many, of course, just another one in a series of things that demonstrate who Jesus was, but none, nonetheless an amazing thing. Verse 29 when he drew near to Bethphage and, and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? 
you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, his owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And what is Jesus doing here? He is, he is telling them where to go, what they're going to find, what they are to do once they find it, what they're going to hear when they're doing it, what they are to say. He's telling them all of the details about going to get this foal of a donkey. This is a, a, a colt, not of a horse, but of a donkey as, as uh, Matthew's account Mark's account makes clear. What is this? Is this, is this something Jesus has already set up? Is this something he's already planned and he's already let the owners of the, of the fall know about it and he's just sending them in to execute what he's already planned? Or is this an example of his supernatural knowledge of things? Something that reveals, once again, the supernatural nature and character of the Son of God. I say it's the latter. I don't think this was pre-planned. I think this reveals a knowledge that Jesus had that no one else was capable of. Once again, just a demonstration of him as the Son of God, him as the Messiah. I'd say, why do you say that, Richard? Well, look, he doesn't just tell them what they're going to find. He tells them what these people are going to say. He tells them how they're going to react. He tells them what they're to say in response, and then the result will be they will be able to bring the, the cult to him. This is not just a knowledge of where something is, where this cult exists. This is a knowledge of people's words and attitudes and thinking and responses. And the very way that the text puts our attention on it, I think, also indicates that. Verse 32, so those who were sent away, who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. Why is that noteworthy? Because it's amazing. It's amazing. It's just like he said it would be. So what they find, verse 32, is just what he said they would find. What they heard, verse 33, is just what he said they would hear. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And what they said was just what he told them to say. They said the Lord has need of it. And the result was just what he said it would be. They brought it to Jesus. The owner said, take it. This is amazing. Same kind of knowledge that was on display when Jesus met Nathanael. You remember that? John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What is Philip saying to Nathanael? We found the Messiah. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He's less than impressed. He's not convinced. Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. I mean, Jesus captures this guy's spiritual condition and his character and his personality, and he's just meeting him. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, folks, this doesn't just mean, for example, that you know there's Nathanael sitting in in my eyesight, and he's there under a fig tree, and Jesus saw him. That's not what it means at all. This fig tree was somewhere else. It was at a distance so that this revealed a supernatural knowledge. You say, how do you know that? Listen to the next statement. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He acknowledges that what you saw and what you know, no man could have seen or known on his own. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Once again, the words of Jesus reveal this is supernatural. He says, you will see greater things than these. That's what we're seeing here, something just like that. 
You're going to go into this village. Here's what you're going to find. Here's what they're going to say. Here's what you're going to answer them. This will be the result. And he was right. What does this say to us? It says that Jesus is in control, isn't he? He's, con he's in control of this. He is making his way to Jerusalem and he is in control. He is not a victim. Things are not happening to him. God is orchestrating all of this through his son as he's led by the spirit. Jesus is in control. And scripture is being fulfilled. Our sovereign God told the world that this would take place over 500 years before through the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I mean, this is over 500 years before. And God is saying through the prophet, this is how my son is going to come to my people, seated on the foal of a donkey, humble, endowed with salvation. This is how he's going to present himself to you. Matthew picks up on this, Matthew 21, verse 4. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus, Jesus, not riding in on a chariot, not riding in with armies, not a victorious general, but seated on a beast of burden, seated on an animal that spoke of his humility and his gentleness. This is a different kind of king. Christ is being proclaimed through this. It's also interesting, isn't it? This is going to be a cult upon which no one had ever, had ever sat. It speaks of his royal identity. This animal has been reserved by God for his son, for this day, for this occasion, for this event. First time this animal had ever been mounted. What does all of this say? It says that Jesus is their king. It says that he is the Messiah. Preparation speaks of the royal nature and character of Jesus. Now notice celebration, beginning at verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Again, this speaks to us of Jesus, doesn't it? Their actions spoke of honor. They're honoring him. They bring this, this colt. And what do they do? Verse 35, they take their outer garments, they take their cloaks, the disciples do, and they place it on the colt. They, they, they have a makeshift saddle that they create for Jesus. They, they put it on the colt that it might be more comfortable for him, and they set him on the colt. And so these actions speak of, of them honoring him. Their actions spoke of submission, verse 36. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. People throwing their cloaks down in front of this animal as Jesus makes his way to, to the city of Jerusalem, throwing their cloaks down in front. What, did, what does that speak of? Putting your, your garment down in front, letting the animal go over it. it speaks of submission. What, what it's saying symbolically is we place ourselves under your feet. We submit to your rule. You are our king. You are our Lord. We submit to 
you. You know, thrones are elevated. Kings sit on thrones, elevated. Symbolically, people are under their feet. They rule over the people. One day, all the enemies of Jesus will be under his feet. All will acknowledge his rule. And so symbolically, when you throw your cloak down in front of this animal, that's what you're saying. I submit to you. They honor him. They submit to him. Their actions speak of a reverent joy. Verse 37, as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives sits at the center of what's really a, a ridge. And when, we, when, when you read mountain in the Bible, you may think of something you know, like the Rocky Mountains really high. Not really. It's, just, it's, it's more like a hill. But, but sort of a two-mile ridge. And then the Mount of Olives is at the center of this. They're making their way down the Mount of Olives where they would see the city of Jerusalem. And as they're making their way over this this little ridge, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. A loud voice. Folks, listen. Worship should reflect reverence. Worship should reflect order. Our God's not a God of confusion. He's a God of order. But if we think that worship should not reflect exuberance, we're just wrong. You know, the idea that worship means hands in my pockets and quiet. You're going to be disappointed in heaven. Actually, you won't be disappointed. You'll be disappointed with yourself, thinking the way you've thought all these years. These people are exuberant. They begin to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Can you turn the volume down, please? With a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had done seen. I mean, they're reflecting. They're reflecting. Do you spend much time reflecting? Doesn't it, doesn't it cause you to worship when you reflect on how good God has been to you personally? When you reflect on not only your salvation, but all that God was doing prior to your salvation to prepare you for the day when he saved you, all that he has done in your life since, all of the demonstrations of his faithfulness, all the ways that he has been so good to us, does it not evoke worship? These people are reflecting. This is reverent. They're thinking about all the mighty works that they had seen. This is praise. And then they say, Verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Their actions speak of him as Messiah, clearly, in a way that's not obscure at all. I mean, they are using scripture that would have clearly indicated they believe him to be the Messiah. They're, they're actually quoting here from Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is, a, this is Psalm 118, verse 26. Daryl Bach commenting on this, he says this, The use of Psalm 118, verse 26 is typological in originally depicting the king leading pilgrims to the temple and receiving a greeting of welcome from the priests at the temple, probably on the occasion of some major victory. This greeting, blessing recognize that the king and his entourage came with the Lord's approval. As it was then, so it should be in Jesus' time. He should be welcomed as a leader and agent of God. The people are saying, you're the Lord's king. And at this moment, everything is right in the universe. Peace in heaven. Here is the king. The kingdom is arriving. This is what they're thinking. The kingdom is arriving, and everything now is at peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We see Jesus. This is, this is fitting. This is right. He deserves this. But now we're reminded of this dark, picture of who we are in sin. 
Because not everybody's rejoicing, are they? Verse 39, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. You do realize, folks, this is the first time that Jesus has ever allowed this sort of public demonstration in the name of his Messiahship. This is the first time. At other times when people were ready to make him king and all the rest, he would shut that stuff down. But on this occasion, he has orchestrated it. He sent them to get the colt. He's allowed this. He's seated on it. He's make, making his way into the city of Jerusalem. He's allowing this. And the Pharisees are shocked by it. This has now gotten out of hand. This is the way they're thinking. This is inappropriate. Oh yeah, we've heard people talk about you as Messiah and all the rest, and they're already trying to kill him and trying to kill Lazarus. They're planning all this stuff. But they cannot believe that he's allowing such a public demonstration like this. And they say to him, it is inappropriate. Stop it. Tell your disciples to stop this. Rebuke them. What does Jesus say? Verse 40. Does he say, I'm sorry. Things have gotten a little out of hand. You know, they're just really excited. You have to overlook it. Does he shy away at all from what is really worship? This is worship. What does he say, verse 40? He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. If these become silent, the stones will cry out. Two future active indicative verbs. If these become silent, the stones will cry out. How are we to understand that? What does that mean? I think the way it's most often taken, and it's possible, is that what Jesus is saying is even inanimate creation has a better understanding of who I am than you do. I mean, if, if men won't acknowledge who I am, the world would. That's one way to take it. There's another way to take it. And that is, when these stop with their praises, and they will, the stones will tell the truth about me. All these people, you know, those, we're not talk, talking now about the 11, we're not talking about that small band of disciples who truly had been believers in Jesus, but the, the huge crowd that would have gathered and been a part of this, are all these people genuine believers? Or do they have a concept of Jesus as king that will soon be shattered? And the result is they've believed in a Jesus and a king of their own making and not the king who really is? Will there come a time when these cries of Hosanna and praise and glory will turn into crucify him? Church, does that happen? And when that happens, when these praises turn to hateful cries for his crucifixion, will there be a testimony to who Jesus really was and is? And will it involve stones? You know, there's a very similar statement to this found in the book of Habakkuk. God is talking about the wicked Chaldeans and the judgment that is coming upon them. Listen to what he said, Habakkuk 2.8. Because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the peoples will loot you. Because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many people, so you're sinning against yourself. Next statement, surely the stone will cry out from the wall and the rafter will answer from the framework. What is God saying to the Chaldeans? You have built your houses with bloodshed. You have built your houses with looting. And those houses now stand as a mute testimony against you. Next statement, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. 
Woe to you! The stones cry out against you. The rafter answers from the framework. Jesus is about to talk about stones, isn't he? We move from preparation, celebration, to now lamentation. Look at verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Over the crest of the hill, now the city of Jerusalem in front of him, the temple complex about noon in terms of where it sits in front of his eyes, and the Son of God weeps. And that's a strong word. This is not someone just, you know, dabbing tears from his eyes. One lexicon gives as, as a possibility to bawl. One says to wail. I mean, he weeps. He weeps. Why is Jesus weeping? Because as he sees the city of Jerusalem, he doesn't just see what's in front of him right then. He sees what's coming. He has a vision of what's coming. He'll tell us why he weeps. Look at verse 42. Saying, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. What does that mean, the things that make for peace? The things that make for salvation. If you would recognize, if you had known on this day what would mean your salvation, if you had really understood on this day that I am here to provide salvation for you. Oh, I wish that you did. I wish that you understood that. Remember, this is, this is our God in human flesh. This is God's attitude toward an unbelieving world. Does God have compassion for sinners? Does God care that men are lost? Did God in human flesh weep over it? The decisions, the choices that men make? Into verse 42, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You can't see it. Can't see it. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you. He sees, he sees the city under siege by the Romans. What he's seeing here, what he's talking about, it happens in the year 70 A.D. city of Jerusalem besieged. Barricades set up all around the city. They're going to surround you, surrounded by the Roman forces. They're going to hem you in on every side. The idea there of being squeezed, pressed. You know, the first thing you do is you cut off the food. Cut off water, if it's possible to do that. And, and basically a city starves. And when they come to the point that they're, they have no strength to defend themselves, the next things happen. What else are they going to do? They're going to te- verse 44, they're going to tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you to be cast down, to, to slam down to the ground as it were. You're going to be destroyed. Get this, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you. They're going to tear this city down to the point that not one stone will be left upon another. And you know what, folks? That's what they did. When the day comes that you will not acknowledge who I am, there will be a mute acknowledgement of who I am. The destruction of Jerusalem. That testimony still stands, doesn't it? For the most part, the Jewish people are still in unbelief concerning who Jesus of Nazareth really was and is. And there's this testimony all the way from the year 70 A.D. that they 
got it wrong. Into verse 44, because you did not know the time of your visitation. He's not just talking about that particular day that he was presenting himself, certainly included, but it just means the entire time period of his life in ministry. You didn't know what you were meeting with. You didn't understand. You couldn't see it. You rejected it. You refused it. And the Son of God weeps over it. God is sovereign, but men are responsible. God is sovereign, but men are making choices. And those choices are sad choices. I wonder if we realize today that there are real opportunities given to men. Today we're talking about Jesus. What did Jesus go on to do? We're going to learn about it as we continue through Luke. He's going to, to go to a cross, and there he's going to lay down his life on behalf of sinners. The wrath of God will be poured out upon his own son. There God will be pleased to crush him. And all the sins of all those who will ever trust in Jesus will be paid for in full at that tree. They're going to put him in a tomb and three days later he's going to be raised from the dead. Triumphing over everything that would have meant our damnation. His resurrection now speaking of the reality of our salvation. And he will ascend back into heaven, and he's there right now, but he's coming again. And during this time, this age of grace, the gospel is sent out to the world, calling upon sinful men and women to be reconciled to God by trusting in God's Son. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and all your sins will be forgiven. You'll be reconciled to God. You'll have life. Life not for a moment or a day or a month or a year or a lifetime, but for eternity eternal life, not just length of life, but a brand new quality of life, God's very life. Do you know that's being offered to you today? Do you know that the Son of God, through the preaching of His Word, today extends His hand to men and says, be reconciled to God? Do you think that's an opportunity? Do you think it's real? What will you do with it? What will you do with it? Does the Bible say that today is the day of salvation? This is the day. Are you sure you'll have a tomorrow? What will you do with this time of visitation? This time of opportunity? I wonder whose moment is today. I wonder if there's someone in this room that today will be your last moment, your last opportunity. You say, oh, preacher, you're just, you're just trying to, to move us. Oh, if I could, I would. No, I'm just telling you the truth. It could be your last moment. And if you reject the Son of God, we will weep for you. But tears won't save you. Only Jesus can save you. Will you come to Him today? Let's pray together. Lord, thank You for our Savior. We see in these verses His beauty, His majesty, His royalty. We see in Him Your grace and mercy, kindness, love, compassion, willingness to save sinners. His tears testify, Almighty God, that you care. And you have set before us this day in your word, life and death. I pray we will choose life. I pray that anyone in this room who is not yet reconciled to you, that this day they would choose life life by choosing your son and eternity will reveal Lord that would that would be your sovereign grace that would be your sovereign goodness and kindness and mercy oh Lord do this we ask and I pray for all of us who name the name of Jesus who say that this one who rode in 
in a humble and gentle fashion on this day that He's our King. That, Lord, we would live like it. That today, in a fresh and new way, we would lay our cloaks down before that animal and declare that we are under His feet. We honor Him, we submit to Him. We reflect on all your goodness to us and we reverently rejoice in Him. We lift these things to you in His name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together.